Good morning, church. Good to see you all here. And uh, as you know, if you uh, were here last week, that we had the privilege of uh, reflecting a little bit deeper on the nature of God's kingdom. And, uh, and we saw that, that God's kingdom is embodied within the person of Jesus. And so you can get to know the character of the kingdom by getting to know the king of the kingdom, and that king is Jesus. Uh, we saw there in the passage leading up to the one that we're in today that Jesus uh, had the power to heal all who are sick. Uh, we saw him in perfect humility, avoid conflict as he proclaimed justice to the nations. Uh, he gently led those who were bruised, reeds and smoldering wicks through to victory, and we saw that as Messiah, Jesus is the hope for all nations. And we also saw the, uh, or the author of this gospel, who is uh, a disciple named Matthew, show us the contrast between Jesus on the one hand and the religious leaders on the other, to make it clear how different they were from each other. If you remember, the religious leaders were aggressive, and Jesus was gentle, the religious leaders were proud and Jesus was humble. Uh, the religious leaders were uh, wanting to uh, control the hearts and minds of people so that they'll be loyal to them. And Jesus came to set people free uh, so that they could be loyal to Him. And on and on we went. And from there we come to this passage of Scripture where Matthew goes one step further now uh, to show us the contrast between the kingdom of God on the one hand and the kingdom of Satan on the other. To further make the point that whoever is on the side of Jesus is on God's side. And whoever opposes him is not neutral, but is actually on the side of the devil. Heaven and hell will be the final destiny for every single human being who's ever walked the face of the planet. And we don't have to wait until the day of judgment to know who is going to end up where. Because it all depends on how you respond to Jesus now. And so as Jesus continues to make himself known, we come uh, to verse 22, the beginning of the passage we're looking at today to see this clash of kingdoms. And in one sense, it's not much of a clash, really, uh, because there's not much of a struggle for Jesus because He's uh, so powerful. But have a read of verse 22 with me. Matthew tells us that they brought Him, that's the crowd brought to Jesus, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. You can tell Matthew's not trying to tell the story to create dramatic effect, otherwise he would have drawn this out a little bit more. But in one verse, it's, it's over. We see even from here, notice the devil, he binds and Jesus loosens. Notice uh, the devil blinds and Jesus comes uh, to give us the ability to see. The devil shuts the mouths of men so that they cannot declare the praise of God. And here is Jesus reversing the curse so that they can speak the words of God and tell each other all that God has done for them, how He has set them free. Showing us, as we're told by one of the other apostles later on in the New Testament, that Jesus came to destroy the devil's work. And as the people witnessed the power of God in Jesus, setting them free from the power and the influence of the devil, you can sense hope beginning to rise within their hearts. And you'll notice that from verse 23, as we see the way they respond to this work of Jesus. We're told there, not just some of the people, but all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? 
Could it really be the promised Messiah who God said would come into the world, a descendant of King David? A descendant from that great king who lived a thousand years before Jesus? If you remember, God promised this king that God would one day send a king who would reign upon an everlasting throne over a kingdom that would never end. God said, I'm going to send a king, David. In, he's going to be a part of your family. And the people are asking the question as they're witnessing the power of Jesus and his authority over the spiritual realm. And they're looking at this and they're saying, could this be him? Could it possibly be him? It's been a thousand years. Imagine if a promise was made in the year 1024. And here we are all this time later, still waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. And it's quite possibly happening in our day. Could this be the son of David? Because this miracle definitely points to that being the case, but no one seems confident enough to really know for sure. Because the light of the gospel had only just begun to appear, and this is a promise and a fulfillment that almost seems too good to be true. And of course, God did say that the, the, the one sign that would be to put all doubt beyond question was his resurrection from the dead. That was the sign that God was going to give to the world so that all men were without excuse. And that hadn't happened yet. They were still trying to put it all together. But I want us to notice that it was the right question to ask. Could this be the son of David? Unfortunately, the only ones who seemed confident about the answer were the ones who had the wrong answer. You'll notice there in verse 24, if you read that with me, we're told, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Meaning, what a way to respond. What a way to pour water over the fire that may have been kindled there. These guys are the religious leaders of the day, right? And they see the miracle. They hear the people ask whether this could be the promised Messiah. And they immediately go to crush the hope that was rising in their hearts. Because all these religious leaders wanted was control over the hearts and minds of the people. And so it didn't matter to them who Jesus was. Even if he was showing all the signs that were necessary to prove that he was the Son of God, these religious leaders knew that if the people saw that, and if they followed Jesus because of that, they were the ones who were going to lose out. Because they would immediately lose their authority over the people. Why would you follow man when the Son of God is he asking you to come and follow him. You see, Satan came to blind people, right? But clever devil that he is, sometimes he will blind them through a literal possession, a demon possession like we see in this story. But as we know, as we read the Bible or as we know from experience, that's the very rare case. More often, Satan blinds people through false religion. False religions that are based on human traditions rather than the Word of God. Keeping people ignorant of the truth that God had sent Jesus into the world to set them free. And so they, they, they remain enslaved by their fear of death and the weight of their sin remains upon their consciences. And no amount of religion lifts that weight and eases their conscience. And of course, no amount of religion 
is going to be able to set you free from your fear of death, unless it's the religion that has come down from heaven, embodied in Jesus, the Savior of the world. And these religious leaders oppose the one they should have bowed their knee before. And in one sense, it makes no sense, right? Religious leaders rejecting the fulfillment of their religion. People whose role it is to uphold the Word of God, rejecting the Word of God in the flesh. It seems a bit odd. But even in our day, how often do we point out truths from Scripture? Are they made plain for all of us to see truths of Scripture that undermine entire denominations? And in response, people say, if this is true, why on earth do you know this and my priest doesn't? Or they'll say, surely if this is true... Wouldn't they be the first to know? And it does seem odd. It seems strange. But I want to draw your attention to something that Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 25. Jesus says, I I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. You see how Jesus says that? The Pharisees are the so-called wise and learned here. And the truths of God were, God's Word are hidden from them because they are arrogant and proud and God does not reveal His truths to proud and arrogant people. It doesn't matter who you are. If you are wise in your own eyes, to use the language of Scripture... God will make you a fool in His eyes. While the faithful nobodies who put their trust in Jesus will go on to inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's what's happening in this passage. And that's what's happening around us today if we had the eyes to see. And what a way to deny what was as clear as the sun shining at midday. They couldn't deny the miracle because the guy who was possessed is standing right before them now in his right mind. They couldn't admit that this was the work of God. Otherwise, the question would be, then Pharisee, why aren't you a disciple of Jesus? And so, in one sense, they do what they have to do. And they become irrational and claim that this must be the work of the devil. The prince of demons, since it was such a powerful work. It was interesting, it wasn't long ago I was looking at the Jewish response today to Jesus and there was one particular Jew who was giving a defense for who he thought Jesus was because he said, he's not our Messiah. And they said, do you believe that he performed miracles? He said, yes, that seems undeniable. How was he performing the miracles then? And his answer, magic. He was some kind of a wizard. Which in our day seems like you can say that, but what he's essentially saying is that he was demonic. It's the same attitude. If you're going to acknowledge and see the miracle, it's either from God or the devil. And yet we're told in verses 25 and 26, read this with me, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, 
he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And before we look at what Jesus said, can we first see how gracious and gentle he is and patient? In the New Testament, as it rolls on, you'll meet a guy named Paul who's an apostle of Jesus. He writes a letter to a disciple-ish of his, uh, Timothy, a young guy he's he's training up into the ministry. And he says to Timothy, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome or argumentative, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. He says, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth so that they can come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Do we see Jesus model that here? You see where Paul got that from? Here is Jesus, who is the Holy One of Israel, the Lord of glory, the author of life, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who has just been accused of coordinating with the Prince of Demons. And because there is no pride in Him, He gently instructs them and leads them by reason to understand the false premise behind their accusation. What a model! He says, every kingdom, every city, every household divided against itself will be ruined. This is what we call common sense. It's not a hard argument to follow. We know families, cities are torn apart if the people are divided. Nations are torn apart by what we call civil war if even the divide between the political left and right becomes too wide, or if the, the gap between rich and poor it becomes too large. How many churches full of people and the Spirit of God are torn apart because of division among members or because of division among the elders? What Jesus is saying here should be common sense to all of us. He speaks to this issue and says, If Satan, use your reason, Pharisee, intelligent, learned, educated men of God. If Satan drives out Satan, he's opposing himself. And think. Think what is happening here as Jesus is driving out this demon. He's binding Satan to set this man free so that the people can turn to Jesus and put their faith in him. Does that sound like the work of the devil? It's the most absurd accusation. And it only serves to condemn them. Not only because it reveals how stubborn they are, but because... uh, As Jesus says there in verse 27, read this with me. He says, And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. And it's almost like he's saying here, show a little bit of consistency. Let's run this logic out and see where it ends up, maybe how it turns out for you. Because the Pharisees knew all about demons. And they prayed to God for protection and for power over these spiritual forces. Sometimes they would pray to God for the power to drive demons out of people who they possessed. And of course, the Pharisees don't drive out demons by the name of Beelzebul, they drive out demons in the name of God Most High. And so they should have recognized the power of God Most High 
as Jesus demonstrated his authority over the spiritual realm. What is Jesus saying here? Which is why Jesus says to them in verse 28, but, or alternatively, how about this for an idea? If it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God has come upon you. He says, if. And he could have been more emphatic there, couldn't he? It is by the Spirit of God. And so, but he says he's reasoning with them. He's helping them to understand so they can come to that understanding of their own will. And this should have been good news of great joy for all the people. The seed of the woman who was promised would fatally wound the head of Satan back in Genesis chapter 3 has come. As Jesus said about himself in another part of Scripture, he said, the, sovereign, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor and to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. This is what Jesus is doing here. He is the fulfillment of all these wonderful promises that God has made to His people. It should have been good news of great joy for all the people. That the Savior has come. And if you can't see this to be the work of God, there is no other way to reason through this apart from the conclusion that you are the one who is spiritually oppressed. And you are the one who is blind and deaf and mute with respect to the things of God. Jesus has authority over evil spirits and he's come to destroy the devil's work by setting people free from the curse of sin and death. And this is why Jesus goes on to say in verse 29, if you read this with me, he says, Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Right, making the point, again, that his authority over the devil was evidence of his mission to bind the enemy of God so that he can rescue those who have been taken captive to do his will. This should have been obvious to them and obvious to us as well. Right, the strong man here is Satan. Not strong compared to Jesus, but too strong for us. And Jesus is the one who has the power to bind him so that he can carry off his possessions. Or more to the point, rescue those whom he possesses. That was us. Demonstrated here as Jesus sets this prisoner free from demonic oppression, but demonstrated completely and finally at the cross. Where Jesus disarmed Satan by dying for the sin of his people. You know, in the story of Genesis, in the beginning, Satan brought sin and death into the world by 
convincing God's people to disobey God's word. And then in the fullness of time, God's word becomes flesh and he makes atonement for the sin of his people. And he rises from the dead to show us that he has power over death for all who put their trust in him. Friends, the only thing Satan has against us is our sin. Because he knows that if he can make us sin against God, then we become enemies of God just like him. And then we get judged just like him. But since Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sin, Satan was disarmed. Because those who trust in Jesus can be forgiven. Even when we sin now as a Christian, we have an advocate who is in heaven, who bears the scars of our redemption so that even if Satan were to stand before God and try to accuse us of a sin, Jesus is standing there as a living testimony that our debt to God has been paid in full. And so Satan has been disarmed. So now, if I want to use the language of the Apostle Paul, now all who trust in Jesus can be released from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the Son. Uh, who is uh, the one that God loves. Now, before Jesus came, each and every one of us were blind and enslaved, like children born into slavery. You know the best illustration for this? Think of Israel when they were in Egypt for 400 years. 400 years of like a generational curse, if you want to put it that way. Parents who are enslaved, giving birth children who are enslaved, to give birth to children who are enslaved, so that as children are born, they're essentially born with chains around their hands. No way out, but you find every way in, in, in a sense. That's us in a spiritual sense as we're born in sin. Thanks to our father Adam, who became a slave to sin when he disobeyed God's word. This is us, this is the condition of man. Some of us, in that state, we clung on to traditions to try to give us meaning. Others clung on to national pride to give us a sense of identity as slaves. Others clung on to crosses and statues and pictures of heavenly things, hoping they'd set us free somehow, but really they only further enslaved us. Others clung to ideologies. Others tried to find identity in our sexuality. And other modern forms of spirituality, all in an effort to make sense of life. All the while being led by the devil as if we were blindfolded and left in a maze with every way in and no way out. But God had promised and He prophesied through the pages of Scripture that a day was coming when there would be no more gloom, no more darkness for those who were in distress because a light would dawn from Galilee. He was that specific. And from Galilee, it would spread through the nations now, here we are in Matthew 12. Do you know where Jesus is at this point in time? He's in Galilee. If anyone should have been able to connect the dots, it was the Pharisees, because they knew the word. 
But do we see why the people were asking, could this be the son of David? Because the light had dawned and the morning star was beginning to rise within their hearts. And to make it clear how opposed Jesus is to Satan and how different is the kingdom of God to the kingdom of darkness and the trajectory toward heaven and hell that every single person is on, to make all this clear to us so that every person is not only without excuse, but has every opportunity to find the path that leads to life. Jesus goes on to say there from verse 30, with utmost clarity, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Now, as a preacher from the 17th century named Matthew Henry said about this verse, he that is not hearty for Christ is against him. He that is cold in the cause is looked upon as an enemy. When the dispute is between God and Baal, there is no halting between the two. For the kingdom of Christ, as it is eternally opposite to, so it will be eternally victorious over the devil's kingdom. And therefore, in this cause, there is no sitting still beyond the Jordan. We must entirely and faithfully and immovably be on Christ's side, for it is the right side and will be at the last, the rising side. Point being, you're either for him or against him. Kind of like a football game. You watch, look at a football game and you've got one team playing against each other. Get rid of the ref, apart from him, because he's got a job. Everyone's on one team or another. That's how it is in the kingdom of heaven. Except there's no spectators. Perhaps to stretch the illustration a little further, Satan owns the stadium. Satan owns the fence that you're trying to sit on as you consider which way to turn. If you're not for him, you are against him. There's no such thing as neutrality with God. Think of it in terms of a marriage between a husband and a wife. If a wife is not wholeheartedly faithful to her husband, she is unfaithful. If a husband has one day out of 365 to be unfaithful to his wife, what condition is that marriage going to be in after that one day? It's gone, it's shot to pieces. This is why Jesus demands loyalty. You know, of course, we're all going to stumble and fall. But in our heart of hearts, we've got to be for Him. And when we make a mistake, we repent. We praise God that Jesus has died on the cross to pay the penalty for that sin. And we keep going for Him. There's no room for apathy in the kingdom of heaven. Even if we are members of a local church, if we do not use our influence to draw each other ever closer toward Jesus, we will influence each other to become lazy and apathetic. And before long, we'll be influencing each other toward apostasy. As one New Testament professor said, Failure to follow Jesus wholeheartedly is as dangerous as outright opposition. And this is why it's not good enough for the church to do no harm. We must be eager to do what is good. Being present on a Sunday means absolutely nothing if we don't turn our presence into a blessing by encouraging each other by the Word of God. Now, 
Because since Jesus has made himself known, we're all without excuse. And since his spirit has borne witness, there is no other way to respond apart from by faith and obedience to him. And to reject that witness leaves you in a state where you are unforgiven. This is where these religious leaders were at. But worse, because as they saw the power of God in Jesus on full display, it still wasn't enough. And they slandered the witness of the Holy Spirit by attributing the works of Jesus to the devil. Which is, essentially, it sealed their fate. And this is why Jesus says to them in verses 31 and 32, I'll get you to read this with me. He says to the Pharisees, and so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy, slander against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, the reason why Jesus separates blasphemy or slander against the Son of Man, and he's talking about himself there, the reason he separates blaspheming against or you know, slandering Jesus from slandering the Holy Spirit here is because it's important as we think about the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, to understand their roles in salvation. The role of the Holy Spirit is to make Jesus known to His people. The Holy Spirit is like the spotlight that works in your heart, that illuminates Christ and draws your attention to Him so you can see Him for who He is. That's the Spirit's role, which is why if you speak a word against Jesus, there's still hope. Because the Holy Spirit might eventually open your eyes to see Jesus for who He is. And on that day, you'll have an opportunity to repent. But if the Holy Spirit testifies to you that Jesus is the Savior of the world and you continue to reject the Spirit's witness, there's nothing else in all creation that's going to be able to lead you to repentance. What's left? We read something similar in the New Testament book of Hebrews. You see the author there say, if someone has been enlightened and has tasted the heavenly gift and the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, and the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, and they fall away? There's nothing left to bring them back to repentance. The church is not going to... What else do we have left? Now, it's not that if you've ever resisted the Spirit's witness that you're cut off from ever being saved. Otherwise, we'd all be damned. The other thing to note is this is not a warning to Christians. Because if you've given your life to Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, confessing Jesus is Lord, you can't also deny the Spirit's witness and in a sense say Jesus is cursed. Does that make sense? This warning doesn't even apply to those who have never even heard about Jesus. Because they can't reject the Spirit who hasn't yet borne witness to them. This warning is for those of you here who are rejecting the Spirit's witness. Because although blasphemy of the Spirit in this context 
is to witness the miracles of Jesus and attribute them to the devil, which may not be a sin that any of us are even able to commit. Either way, the point remains... If you continue to resist the witness of the Holy Spirit pointing out Jesus to be the Son of God and the Saviour of the world, you cannot be forgiven. And Jesus gives this warning to the Pharisees to condemn them. He gives this warning to us so that we would not be like the Pharisees, but be like those who see His works and put their trust in Him. And because we are talking about spiritual realities here, Jesus ends this section by giving us tangible and observable evidence of the Spirit's work in the life of a believer. Tangible and observable evidence. Now, back in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Talking about our works. Notice here in Matthew 12 from verse 33... He says something similar. He says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You see the similarity there? And then he goes on to speak directly to the Pharisees in verse 34... And he says to them, you brood of vipers. In other words, you snakes. How can you, who are evil, say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. In other words, the heart is the root. And our words are the fruit. which is both a testimony against the hearts of the Pharisees who had horrible things to say about Jesus. And it's also a testimony of hope for us that although our hearts, to use the language of the prophet Jeremiah, although our hearts are desperately sick and beyond cure, We can come to the great physician himself to become the pure in heart who produced the fruit of the Spirit. Do you notice that? Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. If you're not pure in heart, don't miss the gospel here. You can come to Jesus to make your heart good in the sight of God. And Jesus then goes on to show how the Pharisees' false accusation against him further testifies against them. Read this in light of the Pharisees and what Jesus is saying to them from verse 35 to 37. This is how he condemns them. He says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. To remind us that if our words don't match our faith, What is needed is a change of heart. Brought about by faith in Jesus as we submit ourselves to the witness of the Holy Spirit. And this also reminds us that the day of judgment will be a day of weighing words. Inasmuch as it is a day of weighing deeds. Because our hearts are made known by the words that come out of our mouths.
And this condemns the Pharisees here, big time. But it also is a very clear and sobering warning to us. That although it might seem as though Jesus is the one who's on trial, being judged as the people ask, could this be the son of David? And although it seems as though Jesus is the one on trial, being judged as the Pharisees accuse him of partnering with a demon in order to set this guy free from his captivity, the truth is, we are the ones who are being judged. As we open our mouths and reveal what is in our hearts, as we respond to God through His Son. In this whole interaction, while the Pharisees are saying one thing and the people are saying the other, Jesus is sitting there examining them. They're trying to condemn Him. They're condemning themselves. This is what happens when you try to oppose God. You end up looking like the idiot. And finally, church, notice words matter a great deal to God. This is why so often when a person becomes a Christian, the first thing that gets cleaned up is their mouth. And if their mouth isn't cleaned up, they haven't yet been converted. And Jesus reveals this to us here so that we can come to Him now in preparation for that day when all who are in their graves will hear His voice and come out. Knowing that on that day, His assessment of us will be on the basis of the words that have come out of our mouths. Because they will testify to the way our hearts have responded to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And they will testify which kingdom we belong to and where we will spend eternity. And so, let's pray. Let's pray that we would respond in the right way because like we're told later on in the New Testament, our our tongues, although they're small, Like the rudder of a big ship, they can steer the course of our life, heaven or hell. And praise God, we have a Savior in Jesus who says, come, so that we can make the tree good by cleansing the heart within you and filling you with the Holy Spirit so that you can produce the fruit of the Spirit that will testify for you on the day of judgment and not against you. Let's pray. Our Lord Jesus, we want to thank you so much that you have spoken really clearly. There are some things that you say that are difficult for us to understand, not because you haven't been clear, but because we are dull and slow and we're hard of hearing. But Jesus, here in this passage, you were really clear. And we want to thank you for that. We really appreciate the way that you have spoken to us as your friends, as uh, co workers, uh, not as slaves, but you've really gently and graciously instructed us. You've used reason, um, you've Uh, You've used warning, you've um, shown us the consequences of our sin, you've given us a way out so that we can receive the kind of hearts that you've come to implant within your people. You've given us every reason, every opportunity to, to be the people who you created us to be. People of integrity, people who are godly, people who are sincere, people who are righteous, people who are humble and gracious, people who still make mistakes, but are committed to 
doing their best to honor you in this life. Lord Jesus, we are a people of unclean lips. We live among a people of unclean lips. And so it's hard for us. And so we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your death on the cross that has paid the penalty for all the careless words that we have spoken. And God, there have been many. And we pray, Lord, that we would trust you, that you have done enough, that your death has made atonement for it all. We pray that we would trust you in that genuinely so that you would fill us with your spirit and give us the motivation to follow you and to seek you so that we would become more like you. Uh, Jesus, as your body, as your church, we praise you for all that you've done for us and pray that we can live in light of it so that we would honor you and that as people would see us, they would see you properly um, as you are in your love and your holiness. And in your desire to see people come to know you. We pray that we would reflect that as a church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, the church exists because we have responded to God's word by faith. And uh, as we respond to God,